Welcome to America's Tap Rabbitsons. May this class be for Rafu Shalema, for Esther Bat Debora, Henya Bat Bracha Debora Lea, Yitzhak Isaac Ben Yehudit, David Ben Matel, Shmuel Tzvi Halevi Ben Hendel, Matel Bas Lifsha, and Shoshana Bat Matel. Please click on the subscribe button to subscribe to us on the America's Tap Rabbitsons YouTube page, or click follow to follow us on your podcasting app so that you are the first to know when an inspiring new episode is posted. I am so honored to have on today's show, Rebison Frady Gerlitsky. Rebison Frady and her husband, Rabbi Levy, run the Chabad Jewish Center, Big Island in Kailua, Kona, Hawaii. Rebison Frady is originally from Palo Alto, California, where her parents serve as the Chabad representatives to the local community. She studied Judaism in the San Francisco Bay Area, in New York, and also in Israel. As a child of emissaries of the Chabad Rebbe, she lives with the idea of spreading the joy of Judaism to others around her. Rebetzin Frady has taught children of various ages, and her devotion to the students, coupled with her profound insight into the mind of a child, has earned her the admiration of both parents and students. Rebetzin Frady was also a head counselor at the Friendship Circle, working with children with special needs in the San Francisco Bay Area. And she is currently training with relationship expert Sarah Gita Sobel to become one of her relation shift coaches. That's relation shift. Wow. Thank you so much for being here. Please tell us more about yourself and what you do. Thank you. Yeah, so um, my husband and I live in on the Big Island of Hawaii, where the Chabad Shulchan here. Um, lived here for five years with our four children, Baruch Hashem. Um, it's always new and exciting. Now we have a, I don't know if you've heard, a erupting volcano right now. Oh, near wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, but most currently, I've been, like you said, training with Sarah and certifying as a relationships coach, which has brought a lot of bracha and meaning to my personal life and also just as a shulcha to be able to have that tool to help my community as well. That's so beautiful. And we're going to we're going to be talking about um, the relationship because I think this is fascinating. I think the concept itself could really, really help so many people out there. So um, I really like that name, relation shift. I'm going to spell it for people because sometimes it's hard, you know, when you're talking. It's relation shift, S H I F T, relation shift. It's a new and refreshing way of looking at and also creating shalom bias, which is peace in the home. Relation shift is a Jewish education and support system for women in their marriages. And the relationship method is based on 13 principles from genuine Torah sources of how the male and female relationship is built to work. So when the 13 relationship principles are put into play, the energy between a couple shifts into one of greater connection and satisfying resolutions, which really we all want in our relationships. Um, and this is really, really fascinating to me. So I, I think this method can really help so many people. So let's get right into it. Can you please tell us how the male-female relationship is really meant to work? Sure. Beautifully said. So the way Hashem created the world is that a man is naturally a mashpia and a woman is a mikado. The man is a giver and the woman is a receiver. That means that in their best case scenario, the way that they'll feel the most fulfilled and the most accomplished is when they are actually able to step into these roles. The woman is the receiver, the man is the giver. The receiver actually has the power to draw out this innate desire in the mashpia, in the giver, to give what he always wanted to give. The receiver has a lot of power. So take a teacher, for example, a teacher that prepares a really great session and comes into the class really well prepared. If she has a group of students that before she even walked in decided we're not interested in learning today, no matter how hard she prepared, right? And no matter what information she has to give over, it's not going to be received. She can't do her job because there's nobody to receive it. So you can't be a receiver without, you can't, I'm sorry, you can't be a giver without having a receiver, without having some, somebody to receive it. So when a woman is able to step into her role as the receiver and be receptive towards her husband, receive from her husband, then he's able to step into his role as giver and must be to her, which is something we all want. The problem is receptivity is a confusing term. We don't necessarily know what receptivity really looks like. We all know respect is important for a marriage, but a lot of times respect is um, explained as something that's actually not very respectful at all or not very receptive at all. 
relationship looked at, looks at respect as receptivity. So instead of respect being, you know, some people think respect looks like being a doormat or needing to listen to everything your husband says and just squash your desires. Or maybe that looks like, you know, having the house clean enough or his food ready for him the minute he walks in or helping him, giving him suggestions, trying to ease his load. All of these things are actually not receptive and they actually get in the way of this dynamic. So what happens when a woman doesn't know what receptive looks like or is having a hard time stepping into her receptivity? What happens is it creates this dynamic where one of three things or a mixture of the three is going to happen. One is a husband that withdraws. He turns inward. So, um, you know, that looks like being on his phone a lot more than the wife would like, maybe spending a lot of time in the bathroom, maybe coming home later than she would like. Just this sense of like, where are you? Why are you not here with me? Right. The second one is a turning outward. So he has all this that he wants to give, but there's nowhere for it to land. There's no receptivity at home. So he'll turn outward, whether it's to the community or to his friends or somewhere where he feels like he'll be received. So that looks like a wife feeling like, you know, all these people have such nice things to say about my husband. My husband apparently has all this time and all these great qualities to share for everyone else aside for his own family. And the third one is a husband that tries to force that space in the Kaylee. Like you're not receiving me. I'm going to force it, which can look like control, anger. So this is what happens. It's a dynamic when the woman doesn't know how to be receptive of her husband. And the amazing thing about that is that the, the woman has all the power. Stepping back into her receptivity opens up the space where he can show up for her and be the mashbia that she wants. So relationships really redefines respect and redefines receptivity, which we'll talk about what exactly receptivity is. Um, but all the 13 principles basically cr are creating a space where across the board, the husband and wife's general position, general relationship is of joy and deep connection. Because this is a law of nature, there must be a macabre dynamic. This also applies to every relationship, relationships that feel like they're falling apart and hopeless, and also relationships that are generally good, and the couple just would like to enhance their bond and connection. Wow. I, I like, I'm, I'm in complete awe of what you just said, because it makes so much sense. And, you know, when you gave the three different examples, you can see how we as women, and we want so much to connect to our husbands. I mean, we really, really do. And like you said, we try to help him and try to be there for him, try to give him support. But I can see how we, we as women stand in our own way of not receiving what our husband has to give. And that we, you know, we step on our own feet when we do that. We, we damage our own relationship when our husband wants to give to us. But, you know, we have a lot of trouble receiving as women. Why is that? I'm just, I'm, I'm curious and thinking about it now as you were talking, like, why do we have such trouble receiving? Yeah, great question. So it's very vulnerable to receive. As a woman, we're constantly receiving things that, uh, that create change in our lives that we're really not in control over. I mean, pregnancy, hormones, right? This is all stuff that happened to us that we don't have control over. There's a lot of things that we're afraid of. Our children's, our children's education, our children's health, our families, we're naturally, we feel things in a very strong way. And there's a lot of fear of going without things that are so important or we really, really want. And what happens is when I'm in fear, if I don't take the time to question the fear, but instead I'm, I'm operating from the space of fear, I'm going to try to feel grounded and grounding myself looks like trying to control, trying to get a plan set up, trying to put everything in place. Cause I don't want this to happen. What happens when I step into the controlling is that I become the my fear, right? I step out of my receptivity and now there's no space for the my fear to be the my fear. We step out of receptivity because it's scary. It's a scary, vulnerable place to be. There's a lot at stake. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that you're right. Because a lot of times we want to try to take control over the situation because that feels more comfortable 
for us. But yeah. when we but when, when we take that control, we also give up our space as the receiver. And it makes it difficult for a husband to be a giver if we're not in the space of receiving what he has to give to us. So that that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, so so you were mentioning the 13 relationship principles. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time today to go into all 13 of them. But if you can please, maybe you would select three of the 13, 13 relationship principles and delve deeply into them and you know talk about them and uh, maybe tell us about the principles and also how we can apply those specific principles to our own lives. Sure. So I think we'll start with receiving the principle of I receive. I create space without approval or disapproval and I acknowledge core value. We spoke about how important it is to be receptive. So what does receptivity look like? What does it look to receive? Receiving is made up of space and value. That means that I have space for you. I have space for your ideas, for your opinions, for your vision, for your personality, for you. I have space for you. And I can also find the value in it. So one at a time. First, the space. Space means when you're talking to me, when my husband comes to me with an idea or a suggestion, I don't need to evaluate what he's saying. When our minds work so quickly, what happens is he comes with an idea and I start thinking, how's that going to affect me? That's a horrible idea. Or what's going to happen if that happens, right? I don't want to do this. That's, I don't want this to, you know, whatever it is that I get afraid of. And because I'm evaluating it, I don't even have the space to really hear him. I'm not hearing him. I'm reacting from my experience, from my feelings towards what he's saying. So there's no space for him to land, for his idea to be held, for him to just have his experience when I'm evaluating and when I'm right away shutting it down from my fear. When I feel the need to shut down his idea right away, like no way, or I'm not even talking about that, or that's a horrible idea. Why would you even think to do that? Or even in a nicer way, like, no, thank you, right? However I say it, the shutdown right away, the desire to shut down is coming from a fear. And if I can slow myself down enough to say, okay, I'm, I don't need to do anything different right now besides to just hold space for what he's saying. I can question my fear instead of operate from my fear. And then I can, what does that practically look like? He comes to me with an idea, either I'm just quiet I'm quiet enough to reprocess what I just heard in my brain, or maybe I'll reflect it back if I'm feeling really scared. Like a husband that comes and says, I want to have Shabbos guests this week. I want to have my whole family over this week. Right. <laughs> and space looks like you want to have your family over this week. I don't need to jump to that's crazy. I work so hard. Why are you putting more work on me? Do you even see how much I'm doing? Just a space to let that land. Just a space. Once. Mm -hmm. No, I was just thinking like, what, because that would make such a difference. Do you know how many arguments start from just there? Just what you just said, the, the husband comes and just normally says something and then boom, the the argument can skyrocket just from there. Because I mean, what you said was it was already triggering, you know, the wife works so hard. Maybe she has a job outside the home or she takes care of the kids in the house. And then here he wants to bring other people into the home. She has to make sure it's clean. She has to cook. She has to do, th do, th do this and do that. I could see that argument happening. But you just prevented yeah. an argument by doing what, what you recommended by just, just listening to your husband and just taking it in instead of just jumping and reacting to what he says. Like you just prevented an argument right there. And it could be on any topic. I know it's about Shabbos guests that we talked about, but it could be really on any topic. Just take in what he says. And then instead of just jumping and reacting from fear, I like what you said about just sitting with the fear. Don't react right away from the fear. Just sit with it. And then, you know, can you go into that a little bit more? Because Let's, let's use that example. Oh my God, how am I going to get all this done? How am I going to get all the cooking done? I have so much to do. Like that's a genuine and a real fear that people can have surrounding this type of situation. What does it look like to like just sit with the fear instead of just lash out from the fear? Yeah, beautiful. So the first step is already hard enough, right? Just slowing down the process, just enough to even get in touch with our fear, to even notice that we're reacting from the fear and just being quiet for that minute, just receiving what he's saying. That's hard enough, yes. right? Once we do that, we can ask ourselves, what am I afraid of? And then there's a process of questioning the fear. So the questions, and I'm going to breeze over it. It's really something that 
in each person's, you know, specific case can really be worked through. You know, there's more pieces to this, but the fear questions are, what am I afraid of? Can I really control it? Even if I can control it, what is it costing me to try? Those are really good questions, actually. I'm writing them down. Can I really control it? Because there's a lot that we that we can't control. You know, we talked about control a little bit earlier. Like we want to feel in control because we that makes us feel comfortable, makes us feel like we're doing something. But there's really not that all that much that we can control. So it's very, very interesting. Um, go on. This is great. <laughs> and even if there is a sense of control here, right? Like if I control enough, something will kind of go my way. What's that costing me? Disconnection, fighting. Is that really what I want? And the last question is, who would I be without this fear? If this fear wasn't present in my life, how would that change this interaction? Who would I be? What would be possible for me? What would open up for me? So this is a process of, of questioning the fear. And this works for everything, not just when he comes with an idea. In order to, right, like we said, what blocks the receptivity is this fear, generally, just getting in touch with our fears in general across the board and questioning this can really even just the awareness of the fear and being like, oh, wait, like, actually, I can't even control it. Or it's, it's not even a realistic fear. It's, not, it's maybe once we question it, we see like, it's not even realistic. It's not even something I need to be afraid of. So then the next space, the next piece is value. The, our husbands are mashpia, they're, give, they're the givers. There's something in every interaction that I have with my husband, there's something that he's contributing to me. There's some kind of value here. So what is the value I can ask myself after I hold this space so he can really just be heard and I can be somebody where his, he can land, right? And he can, his idea has space. Then I can ask myself, what is the value that he's bringing to me? There's always a value. Maybe it's different then I would express it. Maybe it's not exactly the same. Maybe I don't agree with the way he might be doing it, but there's always a value behind what he's doing. So let's take the Shabbos guest example. He comes and he says, I want to have Shabbos guest. Once I've held space for that, what's the value here? What's the value in a husband that wants to have Shabbos guest? He Hachnas wants to be family. He wants to reach out. He wants to build connections. Mm -hmm. Connection, reaching out. Um, generosity. I mean, he's going to pay for the meal, right? These are all beautiful things. So when a woman is able to hold space and value, she can say, you want to have Shabbos guests? I really admire your commitment to Hachmasa Zarkin or your generosity or your desire for connection with your family. I think that's really beautiful. Something that she can actually really feel because no matter what we say, if we're not feeling it, <laughs> It's not going to go over well, right? Getting in touch with, for real, what's the value here? There is value. So what is it? Then he's, he's seen. He's been received, right? There was no shutting down. I didn't need to jump in with fear. Then what happens next if he wants to have Shabbos guests and I don't? Right. right. So that brings us to the next principle, which is I choose the third way. I respect him and honor myself. Oh, interesting. Okay. Tell me more about yeah. that. It's, it's called I choose the third way. That's the name of this principle. I choose the third way. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so, so what does that mean? So you're respecting him. He wants to have Shabbos guests. Maybe you had a long week and you just really just genuinely, genuinely just need the rest and you just don't want to have the guests. So how do you resolve this using the, I chose the third way uh, principle without having an argument? Yeah. Beautiful. So once you're able to really find the value in your husband, just a few more examples, like a husband that comes with an idea to spend a lot of money for something, instead of jumping in with the fear of we don't, what's that going to mean for us, or we don't have this money, or you, you're so irresponsible, what's the value here, right? You're so generous. A husband that's very budget conscious, instead of fighting with that, like, ugh, loosen up. It's okay to have more things, right? What's the value here? He's super responsible. Chances are these qualities are things that these wives appreciate and experience benefit from across the board in their lives. A husband that's very responsible, there's a lot of great things for that. A husband that's very generous, 
there's a lot of great things to that, right? So that's a beautiful value, that's a beautiful quality. Once she's able to receive that, there's no, there's no fight needed. He's seen, he's received. He's not seen as somebody that's out to hurt her or coming with this crazy, awful idea from a lack of some awareness, right? Then he's willing to hear her now. He's been received. And now she can ask herself, what is it that I want? If I step away from my fear and I challenge my fear, and I can just ask myself, what is it that I want? So with the Shabbos guest example, um, maybe she, she questions like, what is it that I want? I don't want to cook and I don't want to clean. Yep. I don't mind actually having the Shabbos guests here. In fact, it would be really nice for me to be able to host and have the Shabbos guests, but I don't have it in me, right? I'm so tired. So after she holds that space, responds with the value, she can say, so I'll just say it again so that we can hear the full conversation, right? You want to invite your family over for Shabbos or you want to have Shabbos guests for Shabbos. It's really nice how much you have and how generous you are. I really love that about you. And gosh, I don't think I can cook or clean this weekend. What do you think? And that opens a, a space for a third way. So many conventional methods say compromise. You know, sometimes I win, sometimes you win. But when I win, you lose. And when you win, I lose. It doesn't feel good for anybody. Losing. Yeah, exactly. Nobody wants to lose. <laughs> yeah, there's always somebody losing. Here in this way, I'm heard, you're heard, and a new way opens up. That's why it's called the third way. There's my way, there's your way, and then there's the third way, which is the way of Shalom. So maybe the husband will say, what if we ordered in and got a cleaning lady? Would that help things? Would that make it easier for you? Or what if I'm willing to do the cooking? Or you know what? Yeah, you're right. It's too much. Let's just not have Shabbos guests this week. Right? It's the space of something new is going to come up and something that works and something that's connecting. And if his original idea still feels stressful, continue with this kind of conversation. Really hear him. Think about what it is that you want and respond in that way. And that always opens up a space for a third way. I love that. I love that you're opening up a space for a third way because you're right. The conventional advice is, you know what? Sometimes we'll do it your way. Sometimes we do it my way. We did it your way last time. Now it's my turn. You know, it kind of like a like a tit for tat conversation. And that somebody always feels slighted because it's always, you know, one person is not always so happy with the resolution, you know. But this way, I love the third way because it allows it, it gives the opportunity for the couple to come together, to put their heads together, to brainstorm for a third solution. You know, a little bit, a little bit of give yeah. and take on, on both parts, but it, to a point that they can both be happy with the resolution. You know, it really, really opens up that door. And I love that. Yeah. And the resolution that comes is from a space of really being seen and connection instead of giving in. It's something that really is from a space of shalom. You know, it's so interesting that you say that because this is like the definition of respect. You know, I've always, I, I've done, you know, I've been blessed to do so many podcasts. I've, I've done so many podcasts on marriage and they're all different. All of them are different and they all stress respect. And I'm, I've, me personally, I've been always wrestling with the definition of what is respect. You know, I've never had it so concrete as you've just made it, you know, both parties get seen, both parties get hurt. And I love this about the value. Everybody brings a value. The husband is bringing a value to the table. It may not be your value. It may not be a value that you originally had, that you grew up with, that you have as a person, but just giving him the space to share who he is and his value. And you're not jumping down his throat right, right away. You're creating that space. And in this way of compromising, it's, I mean, it's creating a third way. It's, it's, um, I guess, an alternative way to compromise, but it's this space of creating a third way is for me, the definition of respect. Like this, you finally, thank you. You nailed it on the head. You defined respect for me. So I want to personally thank you for that. This is what it looks like. Okay. Yeah. And if you want, I can, I can give an example of Please. That, uh, mm -hmm. from a woman. So there was a woman who was so frustrated. Um, she, she, lived in a place where people were coming and going, they would come for a few months and then leave and think that they're going to come back or just come for a little while and weren't sure what to do with their stuff. And 
her husband was a really nice person and people would ask him like, hey, can you store our stuff till we come back? Like we plan to. And he would always say yes. And her garage got fuller and fuller and fuller with other people's stuff. And every time she walked in there, she was reminded of, Ugh, I don't get to have my clean garage because my husband is saying yes to these people. But while he's saying yes to these people, he's saying no to me, right? And she would, for years, nudge and beg and ask and say, please get this stuff out of here. It's been here for 10 years. We don't need to, they're never coming back, right? We don't need to hold on to this. And he kind of would just like brush her off. Like not only would he not get the stuff out of the garage, like day by day, more stuff would be coming in. He would be saying yes to more people. And just this feeling of like, he doesn't care about me. He cares more about other people than me. And every time she went to that, gar- that garage, there it was, right? And she had to go to her garage every day, pretty much. So it was really, really for years, causing so much pain and disconnection for her. That's a really, that's a very real and challenging situation. Like this is a real life example that actually happens to people that could result in blowups and arguments. So this is interesting. I'm sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to point out because this is a very real example. Yeah, and it did for her. She would try everything, right, to, to try to get him to listen. And it just wasn't working. What does that say? What does that say about him? Maybe he doesn't care about his wife. What does that say about where their relationship stands? I mean, everything else is, like, based on his care for her, right? It was really a space of a lot of pain and contention. What changed for her was in looking at this new way of looking at the story. Instead of looking at the story as he cares more about other people than he does his own wife, and he just doesn't know how to say no, right? And and he's not listening, and he doesn't care. What is the value she was able to look at what is the value that her husband is bringing in saying yes to all these people and in taking all their boxes in. What she realized was he's a super kind, generous person to an extreme, like a lot of people wouldn't be. And when she looked at her life and what she has and the amount of time that he was willing to give to her and the amount that he was willing to spend on her and take care of the kids while she went on vacation whenever she wanted just this space of so much generosity that showed up for her in her life wow. in all different ways. She was able to realize that his generosity is something that is so beautiful and so helpful to her on his day-to-day life. Her as his wife, right, got the most out of his generosity after of having a husband that is so kind and so generous to such an extent. So in reframing this, she went to her husband and she said, I apologize for years of seeing you're taking these people's boxes in as you not caring about me and you only caring about them. The truth is that you are such a kind and generous person. And, I, and me as your wife, I, I get the most of that on a daily basis. And that's something that I so value and means so much to me. And all these people that were lucky enough to have you in their life to store their stuff, they're very, very lucky, right? Yes. And gosh, I would love a clean garage. And the craziest thing happened. Two days later, her husband was in the garage going through the boxes and she comes in and he's like, we've held this stuff for years. They're never coming back. I don't think we need to hold this anymore. Wow. That really, this true story, this like really happened? This is a true story. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. I love this. So what, what was her take on it? Like what, how did she come away from that? Cause this was years that he was doing this, you know, and all of a sudden she came and she used this relationship principle and she saw him and she reframed what she did was she was, she reframed his quality of generosity instead of looking at it. Like he was so generous to other people. She really, really reframed her perspective and she saw how his generosity spilled over to her and to her family, to her kids. So this was, I mean, it's monumental. It's we see life through our own perspective. The minute we sh- we shift our own perspective, our whole reality changes. Yeah, and what happens is that's the truth of the story. He wasn't trying to hurt her or, or to care more about other people than her. The truth is he was just a really generous person. And when that was able to be seen and received, instead of him needing to 
fight for his value or defend himself all the time or hearing it as criticism like you're not enough for me you're not enough. you don't care about me all of a sudden it's a space where he can hear it he he's inspired to clean out that garage for his wife because he wants his wife to have what she wants of course, right, because he's such a generous and kind person. He wants to do that for her. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I love that. I love that. <laughs> yeah, and every husband does. Every husband wants to make his wife happy and wants to do what she wants. And this kind of space and value creates a space where so much more is possible, so much more connection, so much more joy and everything that a woman really wants. Right, exactly. That's beautiful. So, okay. So we talked about the um, the two principles we talked about. Um, receiving is made up of space and value. And I choose the third way. And there was uh, one more principle that you want to talk about? Yeah. The next principle, which is very connected, is I choose to trust the connection. Trusting connection builds connection. So trusting connection brings connection, while questioning connection calls connection into question. If we spend all of our time evaluating, does my husband care? Does he even like me? Does he want to spend time with me? Does he appreciate me? Is he out to get me? Is he trying to hurt me? It creates this heaviness and this draining position for the husband where he always has to prove to his wife that he cares. And chances are it's never going to be enough because what we look for is what we find. And if a woman is constantly feeling like her husband doesn't appreciate her or doesn't see her, or doesn't care, she's going to find proof for that everywhere and all the time, right? So choosing to trust the connection is a choice. And sometimes it's a leap of faith, right? I'm choosing to trust. And when I choose to trust, I choose to trust that my husband, of course, he loves me. Of course, he cares about me. Of course, he wants to make me happy. Of course he notices and appreciates the things that I do. I don't need to look so hard at what he's doing and what he's saying and evaluate it all the time to see if connection is available for me. I can trust it. That opens up a space where connection is available to me all the time. I'm free to believe that these things are true. So, so many times, and, and when we trust that, right, what we look for is what we find. When I look for proof that my husband appreciates me and loves me and cares about me, chances are there's plenty of evidence. Even if not, right, even if a woman feels like there really isn't any, the more that she steps into this, the more that she'll be open to seeing it. Because what happens is, in any given situation, the biggest pain point of what happened is not really what happened. It's what we made it mean. Exactly. So... If a husband coming home a few minutes late from work means that he doesn't notice that I was with the kids all day and he doesn't care about my time and he doesn't appreciate me and he doesn't think about me, then that's going to be really painful when her husband comes home a few minutes late. Chances are she's going to be really angry and it's going to cause disconnection, right? It's a space where connection is not really available to them. If, however, with the foundation that her husband loves and cares about her and is not trying to hurt her. And of course he appreciates her. Then a husband that comes home a few minutes late, it was hard physically, it wasn't enjoyable, right? Those few extra minutes, but nothing, it doesn't need to mean anything more than he was a few minutes late. And the wife can still be open and receptive to connection when her husband comes home. Maybe she can even step into the value of how hard he works for their family. The fact that he was at work all day and that that's what he was doing, right? He's not out to get me. That's very important so, because you're right. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when, when let's, I really like this example because it happens quite frequently. It's also a very realistic example where the woman's at home and maybe she's busy with the kids or cooking or whatever. Maybe she's having a hard time and she needs that support from her husband, but he's not there. And he was supposed to be back. I'm making this up at eight o'clock at night. And now it's like 830, 45, maybe even nine o'clock at night. If she can reframe, you know, from thinking, oh, he really doesn't know what I'm doing. He doesn't care what I'm doing. He doesn't want to help me. He doesn't love me. All that that goes through our heads. And we could just reframe it. So he has his own things that he's doing. He's in his own head. He's he's working. He's trying to provide for the family. He has his clients. He has his customers. He has his boss. He has whatever he has, you know, 
he has his own thing going on. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love me or care about me. He wants to get home to me as soon as possible. It's just he's having his day also and he's doing the best he can. And it really, really changes things. Yeah, beautiful. Like taking that extra pain point off of he's anyway not here. I don't have to make it mean right. all these other things. At the same time, we're not saying that we just need to learn to be okay with not having any support and just be fine with him doing his thing and I have to learn to do my thing. The idea is when I lean into trusting the connection and when he came home those two minutes late, it didn't totally negate who he is in my life and our relationship. And that's an inspiring space for him to come home to. A wife that's happy to see him. A wife that's receptive. A wife that wants him in her life. And that's inspiring, right? All these things are inspiring for our husbands to show up more and to be more supportive and to really be able to hear what it is that we want without needing to defend themselves all the time. That's a very good point that that, that you you brought brought up. I'm really, really thinking about it now. Like, I do feel like men are on the defensive a lot. I really feel like that. Like, what's she going to say? When is she going to come at me? What's she going to say when she comes at me? Like, what's going to be? And they're in that fear mode, the defensive mode, and that shuts them down more than it opens them up. So, like, when they come home, they're like, ah, you know, as opposed to, hi, honey, I'm home, you know, that type of thing. So, I really, that's a very, very good point to to receive our husbands, with you know, openly with love and connection. Yeah, and all these things and all the 13 principles, there's so much more, but all the 13 principles create a space where that's possible, where I'm able to, in my heart, receive my husband at all time, and he doesn't need to be afraid of me, right? right? He doesn't need to stay away from me. He doesn't need to be afraid of coming home. Right. And what opens up for me is that I get to feel seen and cherished and wanted and connected, right? Which is what every woman wants. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, yes. I was going to say the, 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 I was going to say the, these principles, they're, they're really, really incredible and they're so deep. And so here's my question, because I know, I know that people out there listening to this, they're really thinking this, like, can this be applied practically to most marriages? Because, you know, there's some marriages that are just whatever, regular everyday marriages, but there are some marriages that are in really, really deep trouble. And I know those people who are listening, who are in those marriages, who are doing everything that they can to improve their marriage, marriages, including listening to podcasts on strategies and tools to help them. Can something like this serve to improve those marriages that are like really like actually in trouble? Yeah. And for a woman that's in that space, I mean, that is so painful and so heartbreaking. And especially somebody that's tried so many things, right? Marriage counseling. And, you know, this can sound like just another thing I have to do. But because this is based on Tyra, and this is the law of nature, right? The Mashbia and the Kabbal, this applies to everybody. And I've seen it myself. I know personal people, stories, where really I felt like divorce was the only option or living with accepting whatever horrible things that they have to face every day. And this changes lives and totally changes experiences. It takes a lot of ownership and a lot of maturity and a lot, a lot of faith and handholding, right? Like coaching is vital to implement these things, especially when there's that much pain and the pain needs to be held and and seen, right? It's it's valid and it's important. Um, And when that happens with this framework, absolutely. Oh, I'm so glad to know that. And I'm, I'm sure that people listening are also so glad. And so that so that leads me to ask you, you know, if people are looking for a relationship coach to help them in, implement the principles that we talked about, as well as the other ones, because there are 13 principles in total, how can they um, find a coach? Yeah, so the website is createrelationship.com. Like you said, shift, S-H-I-F-T. Um, and from there, you can get connected. There are some free um, group coaching calls. There's some blog posts. It's a great network. There's a WhatsApp support group. Thank you. That's great. And I'll put the website um, in the podcast description. So if anybody's looking, they can just click the link and go there. Um, but before we go, we, ha- we just have a few more minutes left. I want to ask you, I know that you mentioned that you, that you have a few more uh, true stories. You, sh- you shared the one about the woman with the garage. Are there any other stories that you could share with us about people who have implemented some of the 13 principles and have really, really seen shifts in their marriages? Sure. Yeah. So one big story, um, 
there was a woman who was coming with, again, years of frustration that every time her husband would come home from work, right? And after her long day, if he wasn't on his phone, you know, uh, talking to someone, he had his earbuds in or he was texting as he walked through the door. If he wasn't, within two minutes, his phone was out. And she felt like, you had all day at work. Why do you need to bring work home? Come home, say hello to me, say hello to the children, take the children out of my arms, right? Right. Appreciate what I've done all this time. Sit down with us for supper and ask us about our day, connect with us. Like if you're gonna come home and be at work, you may as well stay at work. What are you bringing? You're just bringing, right? Like you're causing anger and just upsetting the routine of home. It's just easier if you don't come home. Like, don't even come home if this is how you're going to come home. And she would try explaining to him and asking him and come on, it's supper time. Can you come here? Do you mind putting your phone away? Again, you're on your phone. Who are you talking to? Or even just the look, right? right. The eyes that show how upset she is. So I asked her, what is your husband's real contribution in your life? And in getting to, right, like, let's put this aside for a minute. What is his real contribution in your life? Things like at nighttime, she doesn't have to be scared because he's home, right? When he's not there, she's scared. Just his presence gives a sense of security. Um, Having a life partner, right? What would she have if she didn't have him? A father for her children. What do families look like that don't have fathers for their children? even though I felt like he was falling so short of all of these responsibilities, she was able to see how his biggest contribution to her is not in the ways that he eases her load, is not in the ways that he takes the children off of her, but it's just in his presence and him being in her life. Just that is such a contribution in her life. Wow. Reframing that and realizing that, realizing what she wouldn't have if he didn't come home at the end of the day created a space where she chose to acknowledge that and lean into that, which means when he came home, whether he was on his phone, talking to someone, she was able to look at him and smile and feel like, thank you for coming home. I'm so glad you're here. Just being here brings me something. Her whole energy shifted. She didn't need to now sit there and evaluate, is he on his phone? How many minutes is he on his phone? Who's he talking to? Is he showing up for me? Is he taking the kids for me? Because she felt in her heart like, I'm just, your presence being here means something to me. And thank you for being here. What opened up for her was magical. All of a sudden, her husband was coming home to a wife that was like, you're good enough. You're wanted. You're contributing something to me just by being here. And that in itself, I mean, together with obviously other principles and other aspects as well, created a space where her husband took ownership over what kind of father and what kind of husband he wanted to be to the point where Now, when he comes home, he's like, go rest. Take as much time as you want. I got this. Um, He'll do bedtime for all the kids and say, don't worry. I got this. He's super involved. He'll sit down with the kids and do homework with them. And he'll ask them about their days. And he'll come home and ask her about her day. His phone is left in the room, like night and day transformation. So it's not that we, right? It's not that she was like, okay, I'm just going to, be happy with just his presence and that's all I'm going to have and that's going to have to be enough. Opening herself up to really receive his, contr- his real contribution in her life opened up a space where he was inspired to be that contribution and to show up for her. And it was space for him to do that because it wasn't go- going to be evaluated or criticized. That's amazing. Like that's nothing short of amazing. That's fantastic because it was such a shift. It was such an incredible difference from what he was doing at the start of the story and what happened afterwards. Like it's almost, it's almost like as if she got a different husband, but she did. It was the same guy, but just the way that she was interacting with him, her shift in the way that she interacted with him opened him up to being this person who just wanted to be there because he was shutting himself down before. But now with this new wave, she was that she was, relating to him and communicating with him, he started opening up and he started giving her, you know, more help and more support. 
And that was a bonus because he was already giving her the presents that she really craved and needed. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's the power of stepping into our receptivity. It really, really inspires our husbands to be everything that we want. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. This was actually, this is really, really life-changing. You know, people would listen to this and implement it. They could see such differences in marriages, like like we talked about before, that are really, really in trouble. This is amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Robertson Brady, for joining us on America's Top Robertsons. It was a truly, truly amazing and a pleasure to have you with us. And may the learning we did today be for a Fuwish Lema for Esther Batabora, Henya Batbracha Devora Lea, Yitzhak Isaac Ben Yehudit, David Ben Matal, Shmuel, Shmuel Tzvi Halevi Ben Hendel, Matal Bas Lifsha, and Shoshana Bat Matal. Thank you so much again. Amen. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you.